Now a glimpse into the dark world of Russian politics and murder. A year ago, opposition leader Boris Nemtsov was gunned down in the shadow of the Kremlin and his murder remains unsolved. His daughter, Jana Nemtsova, is a journalist for Deutsche Welle in Germany, and, he, and she joins us from our studio in Toronto. And with her is Boris Nemtsov's former colleague, Vladimir Karamurza, the deputy leader of the People's Freedom Party, the coordinator of the Open Russian Forum, and uh, he himself nearly died after being poisoned not long after the killing of Boris Nemtsov. I'm very glad that you were both able to come into our studio in Toronto. You're here, I gather, for a forum at the University of Toronto in memory of your father, Shana, this evening. And you'll join Bill Browder, who was in our studio a couple of weeks ago, uh, who leads the Magnitsky campaign to impose sanctions on human rights abusers in Russia. You'll be coming in uh, to Ottawa tomorrow. Shana, uh, I want to ask you first, um, I guess it's kind of an obvious question. Maybe you don't have an answer. Uh, we don't know who murdered your father, but do we know why? Good evening, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I think that uh, we do not still know who uh, uh, who were the masterminds of this uh, assassination, because the investigation process in Russia is blocked, and it is blocked for political reasons. Uh, because uh, shortly after the assassination, Vladimir Putin said he would take personal control over the investigation. And now uh, uh, it means that he is responsible for blocking this investigation. That's why we're still uh, on the very early stage of, uh, of the process. Uh, uh, and uh, I Answering your second question, I think that's a very obvious thing. It's, in my opinion, a politically motivated assassination that was the motive uh, of this killing. Vladimir, you're more of a pol politician. Jean is more of a journalist. Um, you are going to be helping Bill Browder with his lobbying campaign uh, to get Canada to pass the often promised but never delivered uh, Magn Magnitsky legislation uh, tomorrow in Ottawa. Why does that make a difference? Why, what, what difference is Canada's pressure and sanctions on some individuals? What effect do you think that would really have? Well, you know, Terry, thank, thanks for the invitation. It's good to be on your show. Um, there are many similarities between uh, the Soviet regime and what we have today in Russia. You know, we have political prisoners. We have media censorship. We have rigged elections. Uh, but there is also one very big difference, and that is that members of the Soviet Politburo, while they were harassing and persecuting dissenters, did not store their money, buy real estate, and educate their children in the countries of the democratic West. Uh, the current officials and the current Kremlin-connected oligarchs uh, do that. And I think this double standard has to stop. Uh, it is our job and ours alone uh, to bring democracy and democratic changes to Russia. Uh, but we ask from our friends and partners in the democratic world and our fellow member states of the OSCE, of which Canada is one, to uphold and stay true to, to your own principles and your own values. And that is to tell those human rights abusers, those corrupt crooks, that they are not welcome here and that their assets are not welcome here. Uh, and Boris Nemtsov was uh, very actively involved for several years in the campaign in support of the Magnitsky Act. This law was finally passed in the United States in 2012. This was a groundbreaking law. It introduced a groundbreaking precedent, and that is personal accountability for human rights abuses. That is, if you engage in human rights abuse, if you engage in corruption, you will have to personally bear responsibility. And while for, for now we cannot achieve this responsibility in Russia because we don't have a rule of law and we don't have democratic institutions in our country, but we can achieve this responsibility on the international level. And uh, Boris Nemtsov came here to Canada four years ago in the beginning of 2012. In 2012, yes, I, I, absolutely. I know that, yes. And, and, and uh, he was both in Toronto and Ottawa, I believe, to talking absolutely. the Absolutely. Yes, he gave uh, several speeches in Toronto. He met with members of parliament in Ottawa. And in those speeches, in those meetings, he, uh, he described the deteriorating situation of human rights in our country. And he urged his interlocutors, members of the Canadian parliament, to lead on this issue and to pass a Canadian Magnitsky Act. Now, four years on, the situation in Russia has become much worse. Uh, we now have not only political prisoners and media censorship and rigged elections, but we now have assassinations of the leader of our opposition, uh, including Boris Nemtsov. At the same and, uh, time, the, the tide uh, in some Western governments, including Canada, seems to be, oh, well, we've got to engage with the Putin regime. There's no point in cutting them off. Uh, on that connection, uh, uh, this morning, uh, my colleague Rosemary Barton, who's the regular host of this program, interviewed uh, the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who spoke of the need to engage with Russia. Let me play that for you and have your comment on it. Here it is. President Obama believes, and I believe, that engagement is important. Uh, you don't lose anything by 
asking the right questions, having the right conversation, and exploring what the possibilities may be. And as long as you're saying, not saying yes to something that you didn't intend to say yes to or don't want to say yes to, no harm done. So uh, there you have. Can I the, comment on this? Yes, I would. I would like you to. That was going to be my question. Please comment. No, so I'm not a politician, but I'm journalist. And uh, but the, it's very easy to comment on this. Of course, uh, on the official level, uh, the governments are always uh, having uh, dialogues. But it doesn't mean that uh, they don't have to react to human rights abuses in Russia. It's a separate issue, and it's not a matter of internal politics. It is important for the world. And if you see human rights abuses in Russia, uh, then the world has to react to this. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the governments can have negotiations on other issues. Uh, but human rights is a very fundamental value, and it should be observed everywhere, also in Russia. And a quick comment, if Vladimir, I could. Please, um, please go on. Yes, I think if, if history teaches us anything, it is that Short-term deals and short-term accommodations with authoritarian regimes are not the way forward. Uh, and uh, we have to clearly distinguish between engaging with Russia and engaging with the current Putin regime and the Kremlin. They are two very different things. The government we have today in our country is an unelected government. It's an unaccountable government. It's a corrupt and authoritarian government. And we've seen, unfortunately, too much of this engagement in recent years from, from actually from very different leaders and from different political parties. We remember George W. Bush looking into Mr. Putin's eyes and seeing his soul. We remember the, the current U.S. President, Barack Obama, engaging in so-called reset with the Kremlin regime. Right. And the result of this has been uh, that those people currently in the Kremlin, let's remember they're all, uh, most of them are from the KGB. They have a very specific mentality. They see uh, those kind of compromises and accommodations not as an invitation to reciprocate, but as a sign of weakness, and they become more aggressive. And frankly, I think if uh, the leaders of Western democracies had taken a more principled stand with regard to the Putin regime early on, we would not be seeing the abuses we're seeing now, because a regime that began by trampling on the rights of its own citizens and by violating its own constitution uh, has moved on to uh, trampling the rights and interests of its neighbors and violating international law and the borders of European countries. And I think, unfortunately, it was very predictable, uh, and it's, uh, it's certainly a very short-sighted approach to continue this accommodation, if not use the word appeasement with uh, regard to the Putin regime. Speaking of appeasement, I just have time for a very quick last question to, to you, Vladimir. And that is about Putin's move into Syria, which is causing a huge amount of concern in Europe because of the increasing surge of uh, more refugees uh, into Europe. Uh, do you believe that uh, President Putin is trying to destabilize the European Union in order to gain leverage, to lift the sanctions, or what? What's his, what's his end game in Syria? Well, I think, uh, as with, uh, with all uh, foreign policy adventures of the current regime, the origins uh, are domestic. Uh, and when Ukraine stopped working for Mr. Putin's propaganda machine, when it became a quagmire, when the so-called Novorossiya project of taking the eight eastern regions of Ukraine uh, clearly failed, uh, they needed uh, some new fodder from the propaganda machine. They needed new imagery. They needed new ammunition for the propaganda. And uh, they found it in Syria. And if you look at uh, state-controlled Russian television today, you will see that Syria has uh, completely replaced Ukraine as, as the source of, well, I wouldn't say news because it's not, it's, uh, it's constant propaganda, uh, you know, to show that he, he's a strong man who's able to send uh, uh, our aircraft halfway across the world at a moment's notice and so on and so forth. So this is primarily domestically motivated. But another reason, of course, is to help a fellow dictator, in this case, Mr. Assad, stay in power. The dictator's club, the informal dictator's club, is a very loyal one, I should say. And uh, Mr. Putin's already seen too many of fellow dictators lose power, from uh, Gaddafi to Yanukovych. And if he can help another one stay in power, he will do it. And I think that's what he's trying to do now. Well, we could talk forever. Uh, th this is much too short. I apologize for that. But I am very grateful that you were both able to come into our studio. So many thanks to Jana Nemtsova and Vladimir Karamurza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.